You're going to hear today from me. You're also going to hear from Tyler Taba, our Director of Resilience, and you're going to be hearing from Farhana Husseini, who is our Director of Programs and Climate Initiatives at the Waterfront Alliance. So with, uh, without waiting any further, we'll just jump right in. So let's go to the next slide. So we always start with our mission, but a quick update. We are going to be editing it a little bit to have, to have it be a little less wordy um, and likely take out a few words that I think um, aren't exactly true about what we do, but the, but the, the gist of it absolutely remains that together with so many people, entities, communities, all of our alliance partners build, transform, revitalize, and protect accessible waterfronts for all communities. We have a major commitment to environmental justice and the importance of all the benefits for waterfronts and coastlines in New York and New Jersey and across the country benefiting all people. And the next slide just covers the basics of what we do. We always start with this, but just a reminder, we are the educator of the region and now more and more nationally. Our conference was last week. I hope some of you could have att could attend and that you enjoyed it. And if not, make sure to go uh, next year. It was the best ever. Uh, we were really proud of what we were able to do, to do there. Um, but we are the educator, not only through the conference, but our materials, our our social media channels, our water wire. If you're not getting water wire and you'd like it, it comes out every month. Please let us know and we can sign you up. We take credit for the five borough ferry service of New York City. Uh, that is a policy platform that we had starting in 2008 and Mayor de Blasio took it and ran with it when he was running for mayor. And that is something uh, that is a direct line from Waterfront Alliance work to an actual outcome that really is a huge benefit to the entire region, but in, sp in particular for New York City. We're an advocate, we're an educator, we work with students, we work on public access and also our Waterfront Edge Design Guidelines Program. So next slide. Um, I just want to also, I just wanted to show people, especially if you've been tracking us for a while, that our team has grown. We are bigger than we were before. And you'll see some of the people today uh, uh, who are on this slide, but um, we're really proud of the progress we've been making in, in, in terms of increasing our capacity and being able to do more. And we can do more when we have more people. And I think that the proof is in the pudding from the you know, many of the successes that you'll hear about today, but also our priorities. The next slide is also just a highlight on some of our um, some of the things we're really proud of. So one thing in particular I want to point out in the top right screen, you may have seen this slide before if you're if you've been a part of any of our Waterfront Edge Design Guidelines or WEDGE webinars, we have been verifying projects across the country. Most of them still are in New York and New Jersey, but the top right corner shows the latest verified project, which is a project, the first one on um, a freshwater system and on uh, Lake Michigan in particular, it's Illinois State Beach. We verified this project, it's a park actually, um, two months ago, and we're really proud because the Waterfront Edge Design Guidelines Program, WEDGE Program, now works for coastlines and all waterfronts in freshwater systems as well, as, and that includes rivers, even intermittent streams. So there's a huge opportunity. These are This is 14 verified projects. We have 14 or more, close to 20 in the pipeline, pipeline right now, and many more prospects as we continue to grow the program. The next slide, this I won't go into a lot of detail on. We have covered this in, in previous webinars, but there are many advocacy wins, especially through the Rise to Resilience Coalition in 2022 and 2023. So just want to point that out and make sure that you know that all of the work that we do and that you support has really led to tangible outcomes and changes in laws and regulations. All right, next slide. Just to jump now into some of the, the meat of the presentation and, and this webinar, we're going to go over our, <clears throat> our waterfront policy platform. But to start that, we just want to put into context the importance of centering communities and all that we do and people. And this slide really shows that. It's about the people that are that our programs are attempting and working with to improve their lives, to make sure that we're prepared for the the effects of climate change over time. And every single one of our programs really depends on also people informing those programs and making sure that they're executed in ways that, that benefit communities and benefit outcomes in the long term. You'll see some of those themes in our policy platform and today. Jumping into the policy platform, the next slide. 
uh, I think that Mackenzie is going to put into the chat right now the link so you can follow it on our on our um, website actually and download it if you like. You may have received it in the mail. If you want a hard copy, please let us know. But this is the first time that the Waterfront Alliance has released a formal policy platform. So we're calling it the 2024 policy platform. We plan on releasing an update every year from now on. And in case you're following or a part of the Rise to Resilience Coalition, this is separate from the Rise to Resilience Coalition policy platform. There are many, many overlaps, but it is it is independent. And we just want to point that out because you should take a look at that as well. We're not going to be covering the Rise to Resilience policy platform today, but it's very similar. And please check it out. So um, I want to just go back to environmental justice and communities on the next slide. And just it's very important to note to note that environmental justice is embedded in every single one of our programs. We actually have the documentation and the planning that we work through each year to make sure that that's the case. We also have commitments internally in our operations and the way that we do business to environmental justice, diversity, equity, inclus inclusion, and justice uh, uh, operational uh, commitments that the Waterfront Alliance has made. And so. We always want to point that out because it is, you may not see it as a specific policy agenda, but it is embedded in every single one of the things that we do. Let's go to the next slide and we're going to jump into the policy platform a little bit. I will review it <clears throat> um, and you can follow along if you're able to, to watch or to look at the PDF uh, from the link that was just put into the chat. But there are five policy categories in the platform. The first is climate change resilience and adaptation. The next is climate and estuary education. The next is public access to the waterfront. And then we have a lot of work that we're doing in maritime, working waterfront and waterborne transportation. That's mostly ferries, which I mentioned before, but also other things as well, and renewable energy. If you go through the policy platform itself, you will see that each of these categories has many priorities that are spelled out. And Tyler's going to go into some of the details on the climate resilience and adaptation, but I do want to point out that the Waterfront Alliance really commits to, to, three, to three components of resilience and adaptation for climate change, and, and mostly centered on flooding and water. And the three components are three, the three components are consist of, first of all, protecting shorelines or protecting areas from water or flooding. The next is accommodating that water. So strategies that allow for water to come in and live with the water and to, ex uh, and to anticipate that the water is going to come and dealing with it when it's there and, and allowing it to, to leave. And then the other part of that strategy is looking at opportunities and pushing for retreat or avoiding flooding altogether by leaving areas. We want to point this out because there is no one solution for climate resilience, and there is also no one green solution for climate resilience. Waterfront Alliance is really committed to the intersection of green and gray solutions, as well as completely avoiding <laughs> impacts, which is the retreat solution. And we want to make that distinction because sometimes we feel that the green emphasis, which is critically important and has to be a part of everything, it can't be seen as the only solution. And so we really want to make sure that everybody understands that and that the solutions that we're pushing for aren't seen in some way contrary to environmental, environmentally sound solutions or ecologically sound solutions. They are all sound and important and we just want to emphasize that. Tyler will talk about that a little bit more. So as you scroll down, you'll see the, the you'll see our, our priorities within those categories as well as planning and laws and legislation that we're hoping to pass over time. And then you'll see our priorities related to emergency preparedness and preparing communities for impacts from climate change. And then as well, uh, how to develop the best waterfronts possible that mostly is centered, centered on our waterfront edge design guidelines program. And then in addition, we cover all of our priorities for education. Not only do we do waterfront alliance not only does Waterfront Alliance, and by the way, we should go back to the next slide. <laughs> we should go back to the, not, not the, uh, the prior slide, so go back to, yep. Yeah. So not only does Waterfront Alliance um, uh, work with students and, and educators in schools, we also are fighting for legislation that will require climate change education in schools. And so that's why this, can, this is showing up in our policy platform. 
And then as you scroll down, we have priorities in pub for public access, as well as for maritime, offshore wind, renewable energy. And the last thing I really want to really think is important that I want to point out is that the Waterfront Alliance has committed and we've signed the fossil fuel non-proliferation proliferation treaty. We encourage everyone, especially if you're associated with an organization, to do so. Ultimately, what we must do is stop emitting greenhouse gas emissions. We do support that. We have programs, in particular our renewable energy programs, supporting the offshore wind industry that are focused squarely on reducing greenhouse gas emissions. But this, the long term really depends on us getting this under control. And I'm sure you are all familiar with it, but check it out, the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty, which you'll see on the second to last page of our policy platform. All right, that's the, I just ran through the platform and now I'm gonna pass it over to Tyler, who's going to dig into some of the details and also explain where we're at with some of our priorities. So take it away, Tyler. Awesome, thank you so much, Courtney, um, for setting the stage. Thanks everybody for taking time to join us this afternoon. Uh, my name is Tyler. I'm the Director of Resilience at the Waterfront Alliance, and we're really excited to go deeper into some of our policy priorities with you today. As Courtney mentioned, I am going to focus on the climate change resilience and adaptation section, um, which is the longest section of our policy platform. And then I'm going to pass it over to Farhana to cover a couple of other areas, and Courtney is going to step in as well to talk about maritime. So we can go ahead to the next slide and start off with climate change resilience and adaptation. This is the section one of the platform. On the next slide, you'll see a breakdown of the subcategories that we have for this uh, for this section. So we can maybe move to the next slide, which has them broken down <clears throat> into five subcategories, infrastructure and design, uh, governance and planning, funding and investments, emergency preparedness, and developing the best waterfronts possible, which is gonna be on the slide following this, but let's stay here for just a moment. So I'll go through a few examples of each of these sections and some of the things that we're advocating for. And then I'll also get into some real-time updates on where we are with a few of the policy priorities within this section. So Courtney already highlighted the protect, accommodate, and retreat model that is captured in a graphic in the platform. And I'd encourage everybody to take a look at that if you're not familiar, it's a really good way to visualize it. Um, and so this section, I think, does a really good job that, to highlight how our solutions span across that spectrum of options and interventions. And that's really important, again, because there is not one single solution. So we need all of these solutions and we need them to actually all work together, too. And so that's what we're trying to do in this in this section. So for the infrastructure and design piece, that's really where the protect, accommodate, and retreat. You can see very clearly we have solutions that are calling for expanding capacity for stormwater management. We're talking about climate-ready housing and voluntary buyout programs that Courtney mentioned. Um, there's also language around limiting development in certain places where it's not safe and using and in, in using guidelines for areas where where we are um, encouraging that development is happening. And then moving into governance and planning, um, we're calling for better coordination on climate resilience and adaptation. One key effort is to establish an office of resilience in New York that can oversee all of the work that's happening across the state um, that, that exists already in many other states. It, it's happening in New Jersey, but New York doesn't have that same level of coordination. And so that's a big piece that we're advocating for. And I'm actually going to get to the specifics of that momentarily. Um, and there's also some efforts to advance some of the really great engagement that New Jersey has done called Resilient NJ and turning that engagement into action plans for communities. And then, of course, um, for folks who have been monitoring with us for a long time, you know that we um, helped pass the Five Borough Climate Adaptation Plan. And so we want to see that moving forward and give New York City a roadmap and a strategy in, um, for how to get climate resilience infrastructure throughout the throughout the five boroughs. For funding and investment, category C, you'll see that we're insuring, we want to ensure that New York and New Jersey are leveraging federal funding opportunities, especially the moment that we're in right now with a historic amount of federal funding. Um, Courtney mentioned our conference last week, and there was a lot of talk about federal funding, and so that was really great. Our keynote speaker was from the from NOAA, from the federal government, and talked about some of the federal funding that has already gone out and some of the funding that still remains. Um, and you know, people are referring to the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law as Bill and the Inflation Reduction Act as IRA. So we're, I guess, giving names and humanizing this money now. So I think we want to just make sure that Bill and IRA feel very welcome here in New York and New Jersey. Um, and then moving into emergency preparedness, uh, this is a really big one for us. And we're continuing to really build on our newest program area called Climate Informed Communities. 
to ensure that residents and communities are prepared for the impacts of climate change right now. So a lot of this advocacy around uh, parts A, B, and C are, you'll notice, about infrastructure and funding and a lot of big picture stuff. I mean, there's planning, but that's not enough. We have to make sure that we're supporting the short-term, really immediate assistance that people need right now. And that's really what this policy priority is about. It's about improving disaster preparedness communications, making sure that people are aware of their evacuation routes and know how to prepare a go bag, are signed up for programs like Notify NYC to know when you may have to evacuate or know when a storm might be coming, um, as well as being able to be um, stay cool in, in the extreme heat that we're experiencing more and more regularly now as well. So moving to the next slide is the final category of climate change resilience and adaptation, and that is designing the best available, best waterfronts possible. And that's really um, WEDGE, the Waterfront Edge Design Guidelines. Courtney showed a list of a few of the WEDGE projects. The, the program is growing very quickly and it's more and more seen as a tool for local communities who are looking to push for better projects um, that really thread the needle of resilience, ecology, and public access. And so we're working with our WEDGE team at Waterfront Alliance to um, identify ways to codify WEDGE. It's already been done in some places. It's in a lot of design standards and codes in cities like Miami. And um, we're really looking to build up on that success and then also build it into state and federal programs so that WEDGE can be um, included in, in um, RFPs and funding streams when those do come online. Okay, so... That was just a very high overview of this, um, of the whole section. So in the next slide, I want to go through some of the active legislation um, and really go into some of the specifics of things that we're working on right now in the middle of the session. Um, the, next week is actually the final week of legislative session in New York. So it is like all hands on deck. Um, and so I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna go into some of the specifics here and happy to dive deeper into any of what I just presented on and any of this in the Q and A or one-on-one -on -one with anybody who's interested. So here are three bills that I just wanted to highlight that come out of the policy platform. And I chose these because they span across all those subcategories that I just mentioned. So we have infrastructure and design, we have governance and planning, and we have um, funding and investments listed on this slide. The first one being the Climate Resilient New York Act, which is um, a governance and planning priority for us. This is a bill that would establish a statewide climate resilience plan for New York and it would also create the Office of Resilience in the state of New York with a chief resilience officer at the head of that. And that would be all done and appointed by the governor. So this would be a, a person and an office that oversees all of the climate resilience and adaptation priorities of the state and of all of the different agencies that have right now some overlapping mandate on their climate resilience and adaptation work to, again, just make sure that this is all streamlined, coordinated, and that projects are happening in a way that are connecting and collaborating with each other and not just happening in a parcel by parcel ad hoc way that we feel like they're happening now. The second one is the Rain Ready New York Act. Um, this one actually just passed in the state Senate yesterday. It passed unanimously 60 to zero, which is amazing. Um, and just very quickly, this is a bill that clarifies the legal authority for New York's 24 local water and sewer authorities. So that's water sewer authorities like the New York City DEP, Albany Water and Sewer Authority, Buffalo Water and Sewer Authority. There's 24 of them that exist. Um, this bill would just clarify the legal ambiguity that those sewer and water authorities have to manage stormwater and sewage together. Um, so I'll get into the, a bit more of the specifics on that in just a second. And the third one is the green roof tax abatement. Um, this one has passed in the Senate and the Assembly, which is fantastic. It's on its way to Governor Hochul's desk now for signature. <coughs> Excuse me. And this is a bill that would extend the existing tax abatement for green roofs and also add equity districts, uh, so priorities basically for communities that are experiencing high heat vulnerability, they would get an additional tax abatement um, if there was a green roof to be installed on private property. So let's start off with the first one on the next slide. Where are we in real time with the Rain Ready New York Act? Well, like I just mentioned, this one has passed in the state Senate. It passed unanimously. This is amazing. Um, and we've actually also obtained a lot of support from across the state. So we have 30 members of the New York City Council who signed a letter. It's a bipartisan list of council members who signed a letter to Albany. We have four borough presidents of the five in New York City who signed a letter of support to the to the legislator up in Albany. 
We also have letters of support from the mayor of Albany, from the Buffalo Sewer and Water Authority, from the Western New York Stormwater Coalition, and that's not even including all of the Rise to Resilience Coalition members and organizations and advocates who are behind this bill. So there's a lot of momentum for this bill, but right now it is stuck in the assembly committee. And so we're really making a big push to get this bill moving and to pass by the end of session next Friday. Um, so we do have an action alert that we just launched today um, and we'll drop that link in the chat. And I would encourage anybody who is a New Yorker to take action, read the uh, description. And then there's a letter that you can actually write to your local assembly member and to the speaker of the assembly. And if you've been ex if you've experienced flooding or have been impacted by flooding, I would encourage you to edit that letter that we drafted for you and put your personal experience in there because that's really a good way for folks to know that this is an important issue that affects you personally. So this is one, um, and we're really hoping that this gets through in this in this session. On the next slide is the Climate Resilient New York Act that I mentioned, which would uh, which would again establish the Office of Resilience and a Chief Resilience Officer. This one is really exciting because in Governor Hochul's state of the state earlier this year, she did commit to a statewide comprehensive resilience plan, as you see in that little graphic. Um, <clears throat> so we're hoping that this is an this is this bill is complementary to the efforts the governor has already expressed support for, and we can codify those so that this uh, program and this office lives beyond this administration. Um, and so here on the on the right, you see a couple of bullets that highlight what exactly the bill would do. And I'll just say a couple things really quickly. The office would um, provide strategic direction. There would also be an interagency coordination team so that resilience is embedded across all of the different state agencies. So transportation, housing, parks, Department of State, all of Department of Health, right? All of these are areas where resilience is important. And at some level, they're already working on it, but we just want to make sure that there's coordination in the way that they're working on it. And that's where the state resilience plan comes in and would be updated every five years to meet um, and match the updates to climate projections that are coming out every five years. So this one is in the state Senate. Um, it does not have an assembly counterpart yet. This is the first year that the bill is introduced, so it's very early. There's still a lot of educating, I think, that we have to do with the legislator on this bill. So in full transparency and honesty, this bill is not going to move in the session this year. But I think there's a lot of opportunity for us to do some education on it over the summer in the fall and winter so that in the next session next year, we can really, really get some muscle and support behind this. And the last one on the next slide here is the green roof tax abatement. So not a lot to say here because it has already passed in both the Senate and the Assembly. But just wanted to mention, again, um, the program already exists, but it was set to expire in June of this year. So this tax abatement is just re-upping the existing tax abatement and making some slight changes to make it easier to install green roofs and also to make sure that the communities who need them most are getting them. So two key things that it does is that it reduces the soil depth requirement for a green roof abate, uh, to get the green roof tax abatement from four inches deep to 1.5 inches deep. And that's to really help some of the larger commercial buildings be able to take this on. So the image that you see there on the on the screen right now actually is of the Javits Center in Manhattan. And that is a green roof that's only 1.5 inch soil depth. And it's one of the best green roofs in the city. So it can be done. And that was a big reason why the soil depth requirement was lowered. And then again, the equity and priority districts based on heat vulnerability. So the tax abatement is actually tripled for communities that are experiencing high heat as a way to really um, reduce the urban heat island effect in those places and get more green solutions and green infrastructure into those neighborhoods. So I think that's it for my section about climate change, resilience, and adaptation. There's a lot going on. Sorry to run through that so quickly, but we will save time for a Q&A and discussion to really um, make sure that we have time to talk about it with you all. I'll pass it off to Farhana to go into our next section. Thank you, Tyler. Um, so for this next section, and again, we'll, we're going to go through it pretty quickly and high level so that we can have uh, time for a discussion later. Um, we just wanted to sort of share in the next slide that you know, there are there is a lot of work that is being done around the climate crisis as we know it to be an education crisis. 
Um, we also see that it's very critical that younger generations are provided with the basics of climate education in order to participate in the developing solutions. Uh, climate and waterfront education is very sort of near and dear to uh, Waterfront Alliance as we have a climate education program. Um, and through that program and, and through our advocacy, we're really trying to give students the tools and resources to understand the causes and consequences of climate change prepare them and thereby their communities to live with the impacts of climate change. Um, so Waterfront Alliance is part of the Climate and Resilience Education Task Force, uh, which has been heavily advocating for the passage of, the, of this particular climate education bill. Um, this bill would include a new learning standard and course of instruction across all grades and content areas, as well as a professional learning resource hub for teachers as well as funding for a green, forest work, a green workforce development and the creation uh, of an office uh, that is focused on climate education and workforce development. Um, through some of our work and, and sort of working with the uh, with some of the senators that are that are on the Senate Education Committee, we've learned that this bill will require some additional amendments uh, in order to be passed for next year, but there is some really good, there's significant good, goodwill uh, to see this come through and and, uh, and to almost be equivalent with New Jersey um, to, uh, to have strong uh, education, climate education incorporated into the schools. The other, uh, the other bill that I really wanted to quickly go over is the Water Safety Education Bill. We're part of the Water, Waterfront Alliance is part of the Water Safety Coalition. Um, and together we've been advocating to make water safety education more available and encouraged in New York State schools, um, as well as requiring, you know, sending water safety materials home to parents. Um, we're at a very unique time in, in, in sort of the, the water safety and aquatic space. Governor Hochul recently announced the New York Swims, which is a statewide investment in more swimming initiative. Um, it's a historic investment in aquatic infrastructure and programming. And last year, New York City Council passed a suite of bills um, on water safety and aquatics, but at the same time, due to budget cuts, a $5.3 million investment for swim safety expansion program has been paused. Um, that's why this bill is so important. And with 900,000 uh, children being educated in the New York City Department of Education alone, um, failing to discuss water safety and climate change in the classroom represents a significantly missed opportunity to inform, educate, and potentially save lives. Um, in the next slide, uh, we'll quickly go into our public access. Um, and so just, uh, just going into the next slide, we can also sort of understand a little bit more about the work that we're doing and our, and our uh, policy framework in public access. We know that the New York and New Jersey Harbor and its numerous waterways and coastlines bring significant recreation and health benefits to our region, but 37% and 37% of our waterfronts are publicly accessible, but only a handful um, are in neighborhoods with the highest need. So we see a disproportional waterfront access. Our goal is to ensure resilient and equitable waterfront open space access is available to residents in every neighborhood. Um, in recent years, we've sort of, we've begun to see some of the barriers to activation, and this includes uh, but, and particularly in lower income communities in co of color. Um, these include uh, physical barriers, particularly aging infrastructure, hardened shoreline design and lack of funding. The social barriers are ingrained in our society and systemic processes for waterfront decision-making. Um, in 2021, New York City developed a comprehensive waterfront plan for the next 10 years with goals that include future investments to expand waterfront access, to address these inequities in community access, um, as well as acknowledging the effects of climate change and the vital role that New York City's waterfronts play in adapting to these new realities. And then finally, advancing recreational water access opportunities to redefine waterfront access. We're now in 2024 and uh, and our work in public access and through our work in public access and engaging New York City agencies and local partners, we're learning that these goals are not 
are often not integrated into the goals around the city's priorities of protecting the public realm, which tends to be focused on more inland and non-waterfront spaces. So through our work, we're finding more and more community-based organizations that are dedicated to opening up small parcels of land along waterfronts for education and recreation. And our goal is to provide additional capacity, strategic direction, and advocacy to support local activation of, par of parcels of land. An example of this is the Lincoln Avenue Street End. Um, this originally was a thriving industrial working waterfront. The site was left derelict for decades and is now facing increased impacts from climate change. Its industrial uses have left behind a legacy of hardened and non-delineated shorelines, industrial waste, etc. cetera. Um, and, uh, and Waterfront Alliance and South Bronx Unite have been working very closely together to advocate for the revitalization of this site to mitigate the effects of climate change and potential flooding, while also providing unique waterfront access um, to the environmental justice communities in the South Bronx. Through our advocacy and capacity building, we now see significant political pressure and goodwill to activate not only this site, but the entire Mott Haven Port Morris waterfront. And we're making good progress um, through receiving community feedback, developing renderings and designs, and coordinating with multiple different stakeholders and partners to apply for funding. Um, it's really promising work and we're hoping to uh, to do a lot more of it and uh, and happy to uh, to explore this further in our discussion. I'll now pass it off to uh, to Courtney to talk through the uh, the maritime. Okay, great. So just a couple more slides just to highlight a few things in, in maritime and renewable energy. So let's go to the next slide. So um, as you all know, um, one of the most efficient ways to bring goods into New York City uh, is by water. But in fact, our entire region is anchored by the port of New York, New Jersey, the entire Northeast supply chain, as well as part of the Midwestern supply chain are dependent on our ports. There are two ports in New York City, in particular, uh, one that we're focusing on right now is Brooklyn Marine Terminal or also Red Hook Terminal. So if you're in lower Manhattan and you look at Governor's Island and you look to the left, you see cranes, that's Red Hook Terminal. And there's a big effort right now to reimagine Red Hook Terminal. And potentially we're seeing um, an opening for a threat of housing development that we're going to be monitoring very, very closely. So I just want to give everyone the heads up. You may be hearing a little bit more about our push to make sure that the, this, this last of two ports that serve New York City and keep trucks off the road may actually be um, eyed for development, which uh, is very contrary to Waterfront Alliance's policy platform as well as our longer term goals. So just a heads up on that. But also, um, I'll skip it for now, but there is legislation that's really important that we can we can cover in a, in a future webinar. I see I, I see a future webinar on all things maritime and transportation and blue highways. So just a, a tickler that will save that for a, a later discussion. And then the next slide, um, I will go over just really quickly renewable energy and just moving to the next slide just to talk about the Waterfront Alliance's priorities. So one thing is that we are an advocate as well as, you go to the next slide, David, thank you. We are an advocate and also an amplifier of the needs of the offshore wind industry. And why would Waterfront Alliance care about this? Well, basic the basic premise and why it's so important is that offshore wind and all of what the country is doing and New York and New Jersey, the offshore wind industry is entirely dependent on ports, uh, the ports of New York and New Jersey, industrial land on the shore. And that's where the, the wind turbines can be staged. And you may have actually caught our last uh, uh, webinar, maybe two webinars ago where Farhana did an amazing overview of all of these issues. And so this is squarely in our wheelhouse and something we're really paying a lot of attention to. South Brooklyn Marine Terminal, which is almost adjacent to Red Hope Terminal, which I was just talking about, is one of the major port facilities that's being developed. There are huge opportunities for workforce development and offshore wind. Waterfront Alliance has a green and blue career guide and that we're, Brahana was talking about our education program. We are including that in our education program. And in fact, when it comes to climate education for youth, often what we're finding is that 
youth who have anxiety about climate change, once they learn about opportunities, about how to work and do things and take action, but in particular work and have careers in climate change, it can make a huge difference. So this is one thing that I'm very proud of for the Waterford Alliance, our green and blue career guide. Um, and then also there's more to say about how to sustainably develop these sites. Wedge plays a major role in that. And we have commitments from almost all of the major offshore wind developers in New York and New Jersey to commit to the wedge standard for their port operations um, and their port new port development. So with that, uh, I don't wanna keep talking because there's so many questions that uh, we would love to be able to answer. Um, and I think one, um, I'll stop there. And I think one got answered by Tyler in the chat, and that was uh, from David Grill about the work that we're doing in New Jersey. So actually, Tyler, if you want to say a few words about it too, just quickly, that might be good. Yeah, sure. So uh, if you go into the Q&A section, it'll show up now under answered. But <clears throat> David asked a good question about, <coughs> excuse me, about New Jersey. And I think this is, so we did have a steering, our Rise to Resilience Coalition steering committee meeting in November, where we did bring together our our strongest partners um, in New York and New Jersey. And we talked a lot about what was next after flood risk disclosure in New York and New Jersey. And I think there was a, a lot of good conversation around what's next in, in New Jersey, but there wasn't necessarily any consensus on what the big policy push would be. So there's a lot of regulatory things that maybe aren't so exciting, but they're really important that are happening in New Jersey. And I put a couple of those um, in the chat. That's the that's the New Jersey uh, Pact. These are some rulemakings that the state is making. And then there's also redevelopment um, of the, uh, sorry, there's the state um, development and redevelopment plan. And so just making sure that climate resilience and adaptation are really prioritized in these places. Um, that's been something that we're monitoring but there's definitely opportunity to, to pick up a new legislative policy initiative in in New Jersey, and so um, we'll 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 be looking with for partners to do that with on the resilient side. I think there is active legislation going on with the renewable energy and offshore wind work um, that we're supporting and working on. But but yeah, maybe I'll just I'll just stop there and and see if anybody has anything else to add to that. Yeah, are there any other questions um, about that or any new questions? All right. Well, uh, I have a few questions for, for Farhana and Tyler, actually. So Farhana, I think it would be great if you could talk about and, and maybe what you think about the greatest opportunity that the Waterfront Alliance has to make a difference directly in communities. If you're thinking about all that we're doing, what is the one thing that pops into your mind as the top thing that, that can make a difference for communities? So it's a hard question because I don't know if there's one thing that <laughs> I can yeah. point to. Um, I think all of our programs actually center around ensuring communities are sort of prepared and protected for from climate hazards coming our way. Uh, we're really well positioned in our programs to bring education, awareness, as you mentioned earlier, to young people and their communities about what climate change is and how it's sort of impact, impacting our local region and the steps that we can collectively take to ensure that we're finding social and physical resilience to these hazards. And, you know, I, I think uh, Tyler sort of mentioned it as we wait for the large infrastructure solutions to sort of get built and designed. Um, we know that takes many years. And, and so our work with, uh, with community organizations and leaders to sort of help build that social resilience through providing um, providing education as well as resources on what can be done during sort of frequent extreme rainfall or extreme heat events, um, as well as the infrequent sort of hurricane and, and tropical storm events. I think it's it's so critical that that we are in the communities and, and sort of providing those resources and, and preparing them with that social resilience. I agree. Great. All right. And then Tyler, um, what are, do you think are the top three challenges that our region is facing when it climbs come when it comes to preparing for climate change? Yeah, good question. So I won't talk about the actual climate risks that our region is facing. I hope people are aware and uh, of those, but I'm, I can't talk about those. I think though it's maybe something more, um, more along the line. I'll, I'll think of it more in the policy framework and planning framework. So. I guess one thing is the slow moving timeline for getting things built and done. Um, that's one challenge that I for sure see. I, I think we're in a place where, 
you know, we're coming into the 12 year anniversary, I think, of, of Hurricane Sandy, and there's still infrastructure from that time that's being built. And so things are moving slow. Uh, in some places, they're moving faster, but mostly moving slow. And there's many reasons for that, I think. There's even actually a legislation that we didn't cover today to help speed up some of that from the design and, and build side of things. But there's also just generally, I think, delays in planning and funding. Um, and, and I guess I'll maybe use that as an opportunity to go into the second challenge that I think might be connected to that, which is coordination. And that's why I feel like the bill that we're working on to try to get an Office of Resilience and a Chief Resilience Officer in some interagency coordination is really important because I think one other challenge that we have is overlapping mandates or um, competing budgets in some cases where I think there's actually opportunity to work together, especially regionally. If you think about New York and New Jersey, we're separated by sometimes water and sometimes a fake line. And so how can we think about how we're sharing resources and sharing funding opportunities to, to move forward on good projects. And then the third challenge I would say is more of a social one, which is that there's all these other stressors on people right now and on families and on communities. And sometimes climate is one that is only thought of when it hits or when something really bad happens, it's on your mind, but maybe other times you're more worried about the risks with housing or the risks with the economy and jobs. And so I think what we're trying to do to bridge that is showcase how climate and how resilience is actually embedded in all of these other systems and how thinking about resilience is not just thinking about flooding and, and heat, but also how we think about like a healthier, more livable future for all of us. Um, so those are my answers, which I don't know if that's what you were looking for, because it's not like rain and, and storms. It's more like social oh, yeah. challenges, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I think, in, and I think also what that question gets at is what some of the solutions are. And and when you when you just talk about okay, the impacts of rain and you know extreme rain, flooding, the solutions are are also really big solutions to talk about. So I think putting it in that context is great. Um, and I just want to appreciate uh, David Girl for noticing a typo in the slide. Thank you very much. We you know, we're gonna I saw that too. We're gonna fix it. Um, and then Rick Larrabee asked a question. I think, Rick, you were asking this in relation to the, the work that we're doing in New Jersey, if I'm not mistaken. So, Tyler, do you want to say something? Or actually, I should answer. I'll answer uh, the question, who is helping support the, our efforts in New Jersey? So we do have uh, a couple funders, uh, major institutional funders who fund our work in New Jersey. But that is also embedded within our our priorities for New York. So they are by state funders or have a very strong uh, commitment to the regional work that the Waterfront Alliance is doing. And then we do have a few individual donors who specifically have an interest in New Jersey that support this work as well. Um, and then we also, as you all know, we do our fundraiser at the end of the year, our, our gala and that in our uh, Heroes of the Harbor Gala. And all of the funds that we raise from that go to all of our programs in New York and New Jersey, as well as nationally, the work that we're doing it for Wedge. Okay. Um, I will then move on to asking uh, Farhana a question. So Farhana, is there a story that you can tell about your recent work um, with communities and maybe how that's illustrative of, of what you're seeing on the ground and, and what communities are facing? Uh, yeah, that is a good question. Um, I can actually tell a few, <laughs> um, but, uh, but to, to sort of, save on time and to uh, and to sort of be respectful of everybody's uh of everybody's time here I I'd just like to share one quick thing you know one one issue that has been coming up over and over and over again is this idea of public access um and uh, and like this week alone I've spoken to several local community organizations who are very concerned about losing their programming and or access to the water and on the water uh, due to waterfront revitalization and development. And this is like, this is across the region. Um, this is, but what we're seeing is that it's mostly in locations that have been historically disinvested. Um, so one organization that I'm working very closely with is Kayak Staten Island, um, who is working to preserve and activate a small parcel of land along the North shore of Staten Island. Um, and that is, and you know, their, their program brings over 800 individuals on the water every single year. 
Um, and through our engagement with uh, with Kayak Staten Island, we learned about an EDC plan um, to revitalize the Stapleton waterfront. Uh, and we've been supporting Kayak Staten Island uh, with both capacity as well as strategic direction, as well as advocacy to essentially learn how to advocate for themselves um, to uh, to include this parcel of land in the in the EDC design, as well as bring elected official attention to this parcel of land to allow for additional advocacy. What we're trying to do right now is to um, get connected uh, with as many local organizations to increase their capacity. Um, so right now, for example, Kayak Staten Island is now connecting with other local organizations in the area and uh, and as well as the community board and are creating an, an informal, essentially coalition of local support for this particular parcel of land. By helping to build capacity with this kind of community organization, our hope is that we start to scale the level of advocacy um, for all of the small parcels of land across the region. That is great. And I, I also like to point out the intersection of our climate uh, resilience work, as well as public access, the revitalizing, giving people access to the water. So Farhana touched on this in her presentation, but just to say that it's really important that as we move forward with solutions for climate change, that we, do, we not only don't wall ourselves off from the water, but we use these opportunities to build access and enjoyment and fun and recreation on the water because it's so important. It's so, it's, these are such unique places. And what's absolutely fascinating about our public access work is the number of community organizations, for Hannah mentioned this, that have just taken over waterfront sites that they don't actually own, that the city has left abandoned for decades, if not over a hundred years, that they're, they're, they're doing their own programming, programming, kayaking, et cetera. And how does that relate to climate change and climate resilience? It's that there still are these great opportunities and we can have both. We can have the recreation and the protection or the accommodation. And even with retreat, there is an opportunity, in fact, even huge opportunities for recreation when you have a retreat model where the areas that we're no longer able to live in can become parks and places that are really beautiful and able and, and provide the ability of society to still enjoy these places even as they're impacted. Farhana, were you gonna say something? Yeah, just to add, I think, I think what you're saying, Courtney, is so, so incredibly important and it also can be an educational tool uh, for building that sense of stewardship of our waterfronts, right? So if we're getting people on the water, if they're engaging with the environment around them, and especially in an urban setting, if young kids are growing up on the water, you know, they're, they're beginning to have this deeper appreciation for the water and not necessarily have that fear of it. Um, and I think it, it's it's really, really incredibly important that these spaces and these programs are preserved for that reason as well. Great. Okay. Uh, there's one last question I had for Tyler. I don't see any more audience questions, but feel free. We have, we have time for at least one more. But Tyler, I think you already talked about the most promising legislation that you're working on, maybe. <laughs> I think that, yeah, but I, that was my question is if you want to highlight that or or it, maybe, maybe a question um, would be what legislation hasn't been proposed yet that's kind of your dream legislation, maybe for New York, New Jersey, for the country? Uh, oh, my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I, I will just make one more plug for the Rain Ready Act because I know yeah. Mackenzie did drop an action alert in there. And that one I would say is the, right now the most promising just because there's a lot of opportunity to get it moving. The other bills have either already moved or are going to need a little bit more education, but I think we're in a good opportunity with this one. And, um, you know, I, this one I think is really, is, is again, it's like a very, it can seem a little wonky when we're talking about clarifying legal authority, but that leak, that clarification of the legal authority was what would actually allow for these local sewer and water authorities to be able to take flood risk very seriously and implement programs um, and and systems for funding to to expand sewer systems and to add more green infrastructure and add more incentives and credits for these kind of solutions that can help us get serious about flooding. So when we talk to legislators, we basically tell them if you're serious about flooding in your district, if you really think this is a problem in your district you have to support this bill. This is like the one of the first steps to really make that happen. And so I would implore everybody here to to take a look at the action alert. Um, 
I have it up so I can actually see that nobody has signed it since we've put it in the chat. So I would like to <laughs> I would like to make another plug for it for, for folks to take a look at it. And I'm happy to answer specific questions about it. Um now on the on the question of if I had some dream <laughs> legislation, <laughs> what would it be? Um I I maybe I'll go national because it's like that's that yeah. helps that can help us maybe set some something happening at the at the at the federal level. Um, you know, there's all this great funding that's coming in federally, which is really, really exciting. I'm not gonna say anything about coordination again because I feel like I've said it a bunch, but there are I think there's a lot of opportunity to think about how we have solutions that can fit across that spectrum that you talked about in the opening, Courtney. And so like, there's a lot of stuff that's happening um, on the protect side of things, but I think it would be really exciting if we had more solutions to learn how to live with water, if we could think about how we have a, a program for buyouts at a, at a national level and how we have funding for those kinds of things. Um, you know, we're working right now with the city to establish their first permanent voluntary buyout program. And the number one question for how that program is gonna head up and be successful is how are we, how is it gonna get funded? Like, how are we gonna secure funding for that? New York passed an Environmental Bond Act, and there's $4.2 billion in that. There's maybe a million or so for buyouts. That's not that's not enough to really do anything meaningful. And so my dream would be for there to be really good coordination um, at, from all the way from the top to the states, to local com communities, to be able to fund and have these programs that span across all these solutions, because I think we're always looking for that one big fix, and there's not that. And so really just being able to to, to merge all these things together and think about them in a, in a holistic way. Great, I agree completely. All right, well, I think I do not see any more questions. I just, I think we'll end here. And I wanna say how much we appreciate you being with us during your lunch today. And also for all of the other uh, webinars that you've been a part of in the past. If you have any questions at all for us or for any of our, our other staff, do not hesitate to let us know. And we look forward to seeing you in about three or four months for our next webinar. So thanks so much. Have a great day.